G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy uh, for this week's edition of the, the round review and my thoughts on the previous round. Coming at you a little bit late this week, uh, obviously a factor in that is the fact that there was two Monday games, so the round finished later and you know sometimes uh, life just gets in the way, so didn't quite have time to upload it before now, so I'm hoping you still enjoy it, even though uh, uploading this on a Wednesday evening is uh, a little bit later than ideal, but we're going to have a crack anyway. It was another round where we probably learnt a little bit more about a few teams, a couple of teams bobbed up and sort of consolidating their maybe their position on the ladder as a genuine finals contender and you know, maybe a couple of other teams made statements in the, in the wrong direction, including my team, uh, that they're you know absolutely nowhere near it this year. So we did learn a little bit about this round, but as usual, I'm just going to go through each game and talk about my thoughts and takeaways uh, from the round that was. As always, guys, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the loyal sponsors of the channel. So if you want 20% off some great male grooming products, you can head to Manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUEFOOTY20. It's not just the body hair trimmer, the lawnmower 4.0, but uh, you know they've got a heap of liquid formulations and uh, some other stuff like deodorants and boxes and stuff like that. So you can go and check out all of that at manscaped.com and get the 20% off and free shipping through TrueFooty. But let's crack into the games. The round started off with GWS hosting St Kilda at uh, down in Canberra from memory. The Saints end up getting a 17-point victory on the back of Jack Higgins in particular kicking four goals three. And he's had 14 goals in the first five games of this year. So in terms of small to medium forwards, he's ranking pretty high in terms of performance this season. I think he probably should have had six in the dying stages. He handballed one off that he uh, probably could have kicked himself and he missed one from just outside the goal square as well. So it was a typical Jack Higgins performance. Brilliant so many ways. A couple of moments that make you scratch your head, but ultimately he is uh, having a fantastic season for the Saints. It's the first time that they've gone five and one in a season since 2010, which is the closest they've been to a premiership, of course, since 1966. It did come at a bit of a cost though with Jack Hayes doing an ACL, which is uh, really unfortunate to see a young Ruckman um, starting to make a statement in the competition as someone who could probably be a long-term good AFL player. Unfortunately, the season's been cut short and I think Rowan Marshall sustained an injury as well. For the Giants, this is another bleak result. Uh, Bruce was good with 40 seven hit outs. Uh, as I said, part of that is due to St Kilda su uh, sustaining two ruck injuries. And they had the return of Toby Green, who was understandably a little bit rusty in his return game. But the only real takeaway for this from the Giants is that they may be getting closer and closer to a new coach. Next, we have one of the more interesting and uh, exciting games, I thought, of the round when Western Bulldogs took on Adelaide at Mars Stadium down in Ballarat. A really gutsy one-point win for the Crows. Uh, despite kicking eight goals, 15 in gusty conditions, they kind of reversed the fortunes on the Dogs, who have been notoriously inaccurate over the last few weeks. This time, it was Adelaide who were inaccurate, but still managed to get the job done. Tex Walker, again, playing a really, really good game, kicked his 500th goal. Billy Frampton played well in defense. I think they've been trying to find a, a longer-term solution down there, and he had 26 touches and 10 intercept possessions as well. So maybe he's found a new niche in that team. I've said it on previous videos, so I don't need to really repeat myself, but I, I really like what Adelaide's doing there, and they find themselves as an outside chance for finals, which is a fantastic effort for a team that I would say is quite young, and in terms of raw star power, I think they, their players still have so much upside, so massive win for them and potentially season-defining. The Dogs, on the other hand, you hope this isn't a season-defining loss. They now slip to 2-4. and four. They're continuing this little habit now of dropping winnable games, and at some point, it's going to get a, too much of a bridge for them to cross to get back into the top four, so their back line didn't have a great game, obviously. See, they're missing Alex Keith through injury as well, but uh, they conceded 16 marks inside 50, which ultimately cost them the game. So it's not panic stations for the dogs yet, but it's getting to that point where you probably don't have too many mulligans left in the season. They're going to start having to win all these 50-50 games. Next, we have Port Adelaide, uh, who smashed West Coast over at Adelaide Oval on Saturday night. I've kind of already done a video on uh, my thoughts on the Eagles from their perspective, but uh, we can talk a little bit about Port Adelaide. They kicked 10 goals to nothing in the second and third terms in what was a truly dominant performance and uh, it's good for their perspective to finally get a bit of momentum back. We saw a little bit of a resurgence against Carlton, you know, where they came back from 50 points down, almost stole the game. And other than maybe a, a slow start to the game from both teams, they managed to sort of bring that momentum in. So they're hoping, obviously, that it will be a kickstarter for the rest of the season. Have they left it too late? That only remains to be seen. But some positives out of the game were obviously Finlayson and Marshall kicking five goals each. Having tall targets uh, in the absence of Charlie Dixon is something they, they really want to sort of lock down. And while it wasn't the toughest opponent, Finlayson and Marshall kicking five is a massive positive. And of course, Connor Rosie moving into the midfield and uh, winning the medal on the day, in fact, 
with 31 possessions. He was perhaps not the clear-cut best on ground because there were so many dominant Port Adelaide players that I mentioned, a couple of whom who keep five goals each. But uh, the potential for Connor Rosie to turn into that premium on-baller is massive for their little transition post Boak. And obviously the style of player he is, tall, fast, athletic, really adds a sort of different look to their midfield, as he would any team. From West Coast perspective, it has been a month since they've recorded more than 40 inside 50s. And like I said, they have a lot of work to do to even become competitive again. The other West Australian team fared a lot better this weekend, taking on Carlton at Optus Stadium on Saturday night. And it's sort of a, an opponent that's become a little bit of a hoodoo for Carlton fans uh, over the last few years, but they finally got the job done over them. They kicked five consecutive second quarter goals to eventually set up their win. And a big feature of their victory was the variety that they were able to have in attack. Obviously, Tabernet kicked seven goals last week. Didn't really feature heavily in this game, but guys like Shaw's bobbed up. I think he had three. Walters kicked a couple as well. So their smalls are starting to get on the end of a few as well. Will Brody has had a bit of an understated season so far, slipping into that Adam Chera sort of role. Picked him up, uh, I would say, for free, but it was actually, they actually got the two best assets in that trade. So it was even better than for free. But he's coming and played a role. He's been great for my fantasy team and with a few players like Fife and at times Monday out of the team it's good for them to find another on-ball option. Cripps was great for the visitors he had three goals and 32 possessions still might not to Brownlow vote or two for that performance but their team only generated 38 inside 50s. For context if that number doesn't mean a lot to you uh, West Coast averaged the least inside 50s of the comp and they averaged 40 a game this year so anything under 40 is a pretty poor result and they were exposed a little once again with Pitney sustaining an injury. As a result Darcy and Lobb managed to win the hitouts 50 to 18 and Carlton didn't really have a response for that. On the Sunday games, North Melbourne took on Geelong uh, down at Blunstone Arena and uh, obviously Geelong just had a massive day out. Jeremy Cameron kicked seven, Hawkins kicked four. 11 between two players is a massive effort. The Cats never really looked in danger in this game. Not too much to take out of this game when uh, one team that you consider sort of towards the pointy end of the ladder smashes one team that is currently on the bottom of the ladder. So for the Ruse, I think they managed to hold in there for reasonable amounts of the game, but overall it's another disappointing performance. And in fact, the average losing margin this year is 53 points. So while they are a rebuilding young team and understandably they're not going to always be competitive with these top four teams they're in a definite slump at the moment and not reaching those levels of competitiveness I think their fans were hoping for this season but it is early days it's a long season to go then the Q clash happened and uh, again not really a game I don't know we we learned too much about Brisbane smashing Gold Coast by 52 points in wet conditions the lines were remarkably clinical though for a game that uh, obviously was played in the wet kicking 21 goal six and young Zach Bailey kicked six goals himself They've won seven Q clashes in a row now. The past six have been by more than 45 points, which is remarkable. And Charlie Cameron kicked four goals as well. So two small to medium forwards there combining for 10 goals is a great effort. On Sunday night, Richmond played at Melbourne on the Anzac Day Eve game. And uh, this was an interesting battle where the Demons ended up getting the chocolates by 22 points. The Tigers did hold in there for most of the night, but part of this could be explained by the Demons' remarkable inaccuracy in this game. They kicked nine goals, 22-76, which obviously if they kick a bit straighter, this game isn't as close as it ended up being. But ultimately, the Demons had a response when they were challenged, and they've actually won every third quarter this season so far. It's proving to be the Premiership quarter. The Stars played well again. Oliver was best on ground with 41. Ed Langdon had 30 in a goal. By comparison, the Tigers were a lot more clinical in this game. I think in the second quarter, they kicked three goals, one from just eight inside 50s, while Melbourne had a staggering 19 inside 50s in that quarter and kicked one goal six, which, you know, tells the tale of their night. The Tigers slipped to two and four, and despite a fairly valiant effort against the benchmark of the competition, their finals hopes are slipping. But with Dusty Martin to return against West Coast, you'd think they get their season back on track with a win. Then we had the two Anzac Day games. Hawthorne took on Sydney down in Tasmania, a game I found very, very hard to tip. I ended up going with the Hawks, which was looking great early in the game. I think they kicked the first five goals. Continuing this little trend, they had a, a fast start. So I think uh, they did the same thing against Geelong, but Sydney slowly, slowly pegged them back and ended up winning by 41 points, which is remarkable. Especially when you consider they only hit the lead with 10 minutes to go in the game. But for whatever reason, the Hawks just pumped the brakes and uh, Sydney ran all over the top of them. Callum Mills was probably best on ground with his 37 touches as a goal really elevating himself to being possibly one of the better plays in the competition on current form. He's a player I probably severely underrated in my uh, player rankings made at the start of the year, which I acknowledge, and uh, he's been a fantastic player for the City Swans over the last little period. 
There was a bit of a concussion scare with Paddy McCartan in this game. He ended up getting subbed out and failed a concussion test, but from all reports, he's all good to go. And after his uh, mandated 12-day absence, he's going to be back, and hopefully it'll be all smooth sailing from there. But the Swans, they probably more or less consolidate their top three ranking, in, at least in my opinion, of uh, premiership contenders this year. By comparison, the Hawks are a little bit harder to get a read on. They're so up and down. They've started the games hot in the last couple of weeks. It matters to beat Geelong, but fall fairly well short of the market against Sydney. So them being smack bang in the middle of the ladder right now is quite indicative of that sort of inconsistency. So there's still a wait and see for me. Then finally, we had the Anzac Day game uh, where Essendon went down by 11 points to Collingwood. And uh, I thought the Dons would play well in this game. I just had a feeling. I didn't think it would be enough to win, but ultimately that's exactly what happened. Darcy Parrish was very valiant in defeat. And I thought a, a worthy choice for the Anzac Day medal had they awarded it to the losing team. But he had 43 disposals overall and 30 and a half, which is ridiculous. For the victors, Jack Junivan kicked five goals. And uh, I think he's become the first teenager to win the Anzac Day medal since about 2006. Overall, a good victory for the Pies to sort of keep themselves in touch with the eight. And by comparison, Essendon at one and five, they've kind of slipped out of finals contention right now. And it's not mathematically impossible yet. It is almost reaching the point where this year might become a bit more of a development year for them, which is probably a bit of pill to swallow considering last year's success. So it'd be interesting to see if they can salvage something this season. But anyway, guys, that is my quick fire round review of round six. Again, apologies, it was a little bit late. I'll do better next week and uh, try and get it up on the Monday like I usually do. But I appreciate you guys all watching, appreciate the support. And uh, my footy tipping video will probably come out not long after this. It might even be later today. It might be Thursday morning, not sure, but uh, keep an eye out and um, hopefully enjoy it. So thanks guys, and I'll see you in the next one.